astronauts. Today, we will be talking about 30 scientists who changed the world. We'll be talking a bit about their lives and their contributions to the incredible wealth of knowledge our society has today. Welcome to Bad Astra. with Sir Francis Bacon, the founder of the scientific method. He was a brilliant philosopher, lawyer, and statesman. He also had a beautiful house with many gentlemen waiters. Gay. No, uh, they were his gentlemen waiters. <laughs> Not with the letters and gifts he gave them. Anyway, his famous essay on friendship was inspired by his friend, Sir Toby Matthew, who he wanted to have sex with. Let's move on to Alan Turing, the breaker of the Nazi Enigma Code and creator of the Turing Machine, which would lead to the development of the computer. If you've seen the movie The Intimidation Game, you'll recognize him. He had a lot of friends at King's College. Gay? No, he had many male friends. Boyfriends? No! Then why was he found guilty of indecency and sentenced to impotence by injection? I... uh... Leonardo da Vinci, the greatest inventor and artist in the Italian Renaissance. He has contributed to mathematics, technology, anatomy of the male body. Yes, of the male body, that is correct. He was also a brilliant teacher to his many students. Who were male? Yes, and having passionate affairs with them. No! Then why do court records from 1476 show that he was charged with sodomy after having sex with a male prostitute? Uh, because he was... Gay! Not every scientist is gay! You're right, thank you! George Washington Carver, the agricultural scientist who popularized peanuts and crop rotation, was bisexual. Alright, are you going to call every scientist on this list gay? Who else is on your list? John Maynard Keynes, the founder of Keynesian economics. Bisexual. Sir Isaac Newton, Founder of calculus and everything you learned in high school physics. Maybe gay? You're not sure about that one? I mean, when you talk openly about how you aren't into women and then have a nervous breakdown because your roommate broke up with you, there's a good chance they weren't just roommates. <laughs> Newton also could have been asexual, but there's still a lot of debate around it among historians. Well, what about John Nash, the Nobel Prize winning mathematician who pioneered game theory? Bi or pansexual, he dated both men and women and was arrested in a police raid of a men's room. By the way, are there any women on your list? Well, of course. Uh, Florence Nightingale, a brilliant nurse and trailblazing statistician who saved many lives. She developed the coxcomb diagram and was very close with her aunt and cousin. How close? Well, her cousin didn't quite feel the same, but Florence really loved her. And her aunt was the one who nursed her back to health after a serious illness. The two became inseparable. Sounds like incest and lesbian incest at that. No, they were all just close friends. Many female scientists had close female friends. Um, for example, Sally Ride, the astronaut. She was the youngest astronaut at the age of 32 and was the first female astronaut in NASA history. She operated the robotic arm on the Challenger SPAS-1 and created the Sally Ride Foundation to help young girls get interested in STEM. And her best friend was Tam O'Shaughnessy. Friend? Yes, very close gal pals. Oh, I understand. 
I too have a very close gal pal. Oh, that's so delightful for you both. So close that I marry her. That's not how things were for Sally Ride. She had a husband. Her foundation was the one who mentioned her 27 year partnership with Tam in her obituary and Sally Ride is recognized as the first gay astronaut. Here, let me just read the rest of your list. I just don't understand why we can't acknowledge that these people had very regular friendships. Not everything has to be about sexual partnerships. You're right, Nikola Tesla was rumored to be asexual. He had no such sexual relationships to speak of. But we don't know for sure if it was from his germophobia or because he lacked sexual attraction. But he did note his celibacy as a major contributing factor to his brilliant science. But back to the list. We have Michael Dillon, brilliant physician, who famously was the first trans man to undergo phallioplasty. Oh, there's more trans men on here, including Alan Hart, a public health researcher who was on the forefront of the fight against tuberculosis. He was also the first trans man in the United States to undergo a hysterectomy. Ben Barris was a fantastic researcher of glia, a type of brain cell, in different diseases and revolutionized our understanding of the brain. He was also the first trans person elected to the US National Academy of Sciences and was a major advocate for gender equality in STEM. We also have several trans women on the list. Angela Clayton was a physicist in the fields of nuclear criticality, safety, and health physics. She held several leadership roles in organizations focusing on atomic weapons and was awarded the Member of the Order of the British Empire for her work as a trans activist. Lynn Conway is a computer scientist who revolutionized microchip designs and many inventions that led to improved computer processing. She's also a trans activist. Is everyone on my list a member of the LGBTQ community? Uh, yes. Every single one of these scientists is some flavor of queer. I mean, Lauren Esposito, the only woman expert on scorpions in the world, is on this list and she is the co-founder of 500 Queer Scientists. I don't know how you could have missed that, if I'm honest. Every single one, even um, Clyde Varhoftig, the geologist that made the role of tectonic plates in earthquakes public knowledge? Yep. Gay. And he's been a huge advocate for the acceptance of queer people in science. His longtime partner and research assistant, Alan Vern Cox, is the one who developed a way to test the theory of plate tectonics. Like, what a scientific power couple right there. And speaking of scientific power couples, let's talk about Sarah Josephine Baker and Louise Pierce, or rather, their possible polytriad situation with writer I.A.R. Wiley, but like, not quite. Baker was famous for tracking down Mary Mallon, aka Typhoid Mary, aka Patient Zero. She was huge in the public health scene, especially in immigrant communities. She lived with I.A.R. Wiley, who she was dating. Then, Louise Pierce, famous pathologist that developed a treatment for trypanosomiasis, or African sleeping sickness, moved in with the two of them. All three were members of the feminist society Heterodoxy, of which most of the members were some flavor of bisexual or woman-oriented women, as they called themselves. And after Baker died, Wiley and Pierce still lived together and ended up getting buried next to each other. So not confirmed in any way that these three were all girlfriends, but it looks like Wiley had a thing for women scientists, which same. We can't continue to keep putting queer labels on historical figures who never confirmed that this was part of their identity. It's, it's all hearsay. Really? Since I thought that woman oriented women was pretty clear. And if you want to talk about scientists who were openly gay, we can talk about Neil Devine, who made major contributions to modern star formation theory. Or we could talk about Ruth Gates, a marine biologist and conservationist who bred super corals that are more resistant to higher temperatures to help protect coral reefs from the effect of climate change. Or what about James Pollock, world-renowned expert in planetary atmospheres and helped us better understand our solar system.
We could also mention Bruce Voller, a biologist and AIDS researcher who co-founded what is now referred to as the National LGBTQ Task Force. It used to be the National Gay Task Force until they decided to make it more inclusive to bi, trans, and other queer identities. There's also Richard Summerbell, Canadian mycologist and award-winning author and songwriter. Fun fact. He lives with his husband in Toronto, where he is the research director of Sporometrics, a microbiological testing company. We could even talk about John Hall, nicknamed Mad Dog by his students, but he's not a fan of it now. He's a computer programmer who announced in an article that he's gay. Or we can talk about Margaret Mead, psychologist and anthropologist who helped pioneer a better understanding of different sexual behaviors in human societies. She had several husbands and never outwardly said she was gay. She didn't need to with those highly romantic letters to fellow anthropologist Rhonda Metro. Nor did Colin Turnbull, the pioneer of ethnomusicology, when he exchanged marriage vows to Joseph Tells. The anthropologists seem very much each other's types. But there are plenty of reasons queer people can't say they're openly queer throughout history. Sexologist Magnus Hirschfeld was regularly assaulted because he was a gay Jewish man living in Germany when the Nazis were growing in power. He had to go to Switzerland after his international tour because he would have been killed if he went back to Germany. Sonia Kovalevsky, Russian mathematician, not only had to overcome gender barriers in her field, but also had to have a fictitious marriage to a man just to gain permission to study abroad where she could complete her education and develop Kovalevsky's theorem. You've seen how homophobic Russian policy is today with their gay propaganda law that resulted in an increase in homophobic hate crimes. So what makes you think that the 1800s were any safer? So of course, language had to be coded. Alexander von Humboldt, Prussian naturalist who laid the foundations for modern meteorology and geography, was described by his sister-in-law as, nothing will ever have a great influence on Alexander that doesn't come through men. So while historians bicker about what that actually means and whether he was gay or asexual or just had a bunch of close male friends, the queer community has historically had to hide in plain sight. We would be killed if we were open about our identities. The fact of the matter is that we've existed throughout history because being gay or trans is not something you can change, just as Hirschfeld wrote. The reason why you're seeing more of us now or why historical figures are suddenly being claimed as part of the community is because we're pretty confident we won't be killed for it now at least at time of recording and in the United States because there are still some incredibly homophobic and transphobic policies around the world. And especially given how official policy here can flip-flop with each presidency, we're still fighting to keep the progress we've already made. Well, I suppose the fact that Pride Month exists proves we are making progress. But we still have a long way to go. Not being killed for being gay or trans is the bare minimum. Painting rainbow colors on your logo isn't going to end transphobic hate crimes, medical discrimination, police brutality, employment and housing discrimination, and casual homophobia and transphobia in our culture. Our own community has a lot of internal issues to address too. Racism, biphobia, acephobia, internalized misogyny, and transphobia, especially against non-binary people, are only some of the issues that exist within the LGBTQIA community. At the end of the day, we just have to let people live as their most authentic selves, as long as they're not hurting anybody else. And part of that is combating the straightwashing and erasure of historical representation. Thanks for joining us for our Pride Month special from the queer women of Bad Astra. To all of our lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans, queer or questioning, intersex, and asexual viewers, Happy Pride, whether you're out or not. To all of our cis straight viewers, thanks for watching, and no, the A does not stand for ally. Aster out. Pod Astra, Pod Astra.
Spring. To the stars. To the stars.